Hello, good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Um, I feel like we're kind of at church because I'm waiting on you to make your way into this room. And so here we are together to watch, to listen to a message today. And before, um, before I get started this morning on our message, um, I just want to um, say a word of encouragement that I know this time is difficult. I know that this is really weird and crazy, but uh, we are going to get through this together and it's going to be awesome. And I'm just so glad that each of you are coming in and as you're, as you're making your way virtually into uh, the uh, message today, just know I love you. Um, I can't wait till the day we can meet again. And um, I can't wait to see each and every one of you again and, um, and um, be together. Um, I know this is a difficult time. There's lots of anxiety. There's lots of things going on. But together, we're going to make it through this. And God is faithful. And God is going to um, get us through all of this together. So, uh, you know, I just want to say a good morning to you, uh, Cross Point family. Um, I miss you terribly. And I hope you're all doing well. Um, just know that your elders, um, all the elders and the ministers, we're all praying for you. We are here for you in any way we can, uh, as, as well as um, when we're doing it. Sorry, I'm getting notifications on my phone. Um, and um, we are here together to take a, take a little bit of time out of our life and go through some, some of the wisdom of God um, that we've got in, in his word. So before we get started, let's, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we can't be together physically, but we can be together virtually, and we thank you that we live in a time like this, that we can have these technologies, uh, that we can um, be together, that we can be together in spirit and in truth and in unity together today. Uh, Father, through our phones or through our computers or TVs, uh, whichever medium, God, um, but you promise in your word, as Christy was reminding um, the kids today that where two or three are gathered, there you are among us. So we're here gathered together as a family today, and we ask that you would just bless this time, bl open our hearts to your word, um, and let us um, grow closer to you. Father, uh, be with all those on our sick list, be with all those who are struggling and hurting, be with the world right now, God, as it's experiencing something that our generations have never seen before. Uh, Father, um, give us comfort, give us your peace that passes all understanding, and let us trust in you through all this. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning we are in the Gospel of Mark, and we are in the 13th chapter. Now, um, we're going a bit out of order this week um, in our reading of Mark's Gospel. Now, just so you know, um, uh, I'm going to talk about chapter 13 today, and Noland actually will be preaching next Sunday. He's going to go out uh, and preach on the triumphal entry uh, next Sunday right here on this live stream. Um, I'm going to be on vacation. It was planned before this whole thing went down that I was going to take a staycation, so I'm going to still do that, but uh, Nolan will be bringing the word to you next Sunday morning, and he's going to talk about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem back in Mark chapter 11. Today, we're going to be on Mark uh, 13. Um, so if you've got your Bible, let's jump into this. Uh, Mark 13, verse 1, it says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. So the disciples are, uh, and, and Jesus, they enter Jerusalem, and they're enamored by the beauty of the temple. It's magnificent. The, the temple complex is a magnificent site. Um, Herod had begun construction in around 20 BC, and workers would finish it nearly 50 years later. Now, the temple is located on top of a massive mountain and is a giant complex, okay? The historian and Josephus tells us that the walls surrounding the grounds of the temple were a stadium in their length. That's our equivalent today of 607 feet. Now, the temple itself is 150 feet wide by 150 feet high at its highest point. It's equivalent to a 15-story building. 
So the white marble stones were inlaid with gold that would glisten in the sun almost blindingly as it sat atop this mountain. And the inside of the temple was decorated with gold and silver and crimson and purples and cedar wood from Lebanon. And it's truly an epic and beautiful place to see. But Jesus sees the temple And he has a little bit of a different response. The the disciples see only the beautiful exterior of the temple. Jesus, however, sees that there's a cancer rooted deep inside. So let's keep reading in verse 2. Mark 13 verse 2 says, Do you see all these great buildings? Jesus replied, Not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, Jesus says the temple, this incredible, glorious place, it's going to be demolished. And earlier, Jesus said in chapter 11, verse 17, isn't it written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. In that instance, Jesus was quoting the prophet Jeremiah, who foretold the destruction of the temple six centuries earlier. You can find that in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Jeremiah said that God would destroy the city and the temple and the people because of the people's wickedness. And it happened. And Nebuchadnezzar came along and destroyed the city and took the people into exile in 587 BC. Now Jesus says that it's going to happen again. And for the same reason, it's for the wickedness of the people. Now, the old is, uh, here's the thing about this idea that, that Jesus is trying to get across that the disciples just don't get yet, is that the old is passing away and the new is getting ready to be born. Okay, the old worship centered on the temple has become corrupt. This new worship will be centered on the Messiah, the new temple, the new place that people will encounter God. And so the New Testament tells us that we now, you and me, if we are baptized into Christ, we are uh, the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 or 2 Corinthians 6 or 1 Peter 2 or Revelation 3 tell us those ideas. And obviously, Jesus has caught the disciples off guard here when he says this beautiful thing is going to be destroyed because they take a walk and they walk across the valley to the Mount of Olives. Now look at verses three and four. It says, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite of the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? The Mount of Olives sits directly across the Kidron Valley and gives this incredible view of Jerusalem, but more specifically, this incredible view of the temple itself. And so it's here that four disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, ask two questions to Jesus. The first one is, when is this going to happen? When will this be? And the second question is, what are the signs? So when will this be and what are the signs? And and so they asked Jesus this question, but Jesus isn't going to answer either one of those questions. It's going to sound like he does, but he doesn't answer them at all. Now look at verse 5 through 8. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus' answer to the people here is to beware of people who try and take advantage of all the destruction that's happening. Now, to me, this is really insightful. Like in verse 7, he says, when you hear of wars and rumors and wars and nations fighting each other, earthquakes and famines, I mean, that's the way the world really is, right? Like we're hearing of earthquakes, we're hearing of famines, we're in a global pandemic right now. And this is the way the world is right now. You can identify the crazy thing about Jesus' words is you can identify them with anything, any point in human history, okay? In all those situations, here's the thing that Jesus is saying. In all those situations, there are people who will come along and they're going to try and draw attention to themselves and try to get people to follow them, try to exploit the situation in one way or another, And Jesus is saying, watch out for the deceptive people who take advantage of the crisis that's always unfolding and make false claims about themselves. Jesus has a warning to those of us living in these precarious times. He's telling us to watch 
out. Okay? Jesus calls the disciples. He says, pay attention. Watch. This is a call to see and discern, a call to keep your eyes open. And Jesus says in verse 5, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. Jesus warns that there's going to be fakes and phonies, people claiming to be the Messiah or at least acting or thinking like they are. And there, in our day, not all messianic pretenders are religious. A lot of people claim to have answers to our deepest desires. We look to politicians or to fitness experts or to talk show hosts or to financial advisors or to toilet paper companies. But some pretenders are religious. They're often charismatic personalities who twist Christian, Christianity into a crossless faith and they tell us the road is broad and smooth and the way leads to eternal life. At best, they gorge themselves on our fame and money. At worst, they lead us to our death. I can think of Jim Jones of Jonestown, the massacre that happened there, or David Koresh in Waco. Uh, they come to mind when I think of people who are taking advantage of things that are going on in the world. We have to watch out for such people, especially in the times we find ourselves living in. But the hardest thing to realize in all this, folks, the hardest thing to get through our brains is that the, mo the people most likely to lead us off course may be the ones nearest to us, people that we respect, people that we adore, the people that we look up to spiritually, the people that we think have it figured out, the people that look like they've got it all together, our best friends, our family, our co-workers, our boss, our supervisor. Those are the people that can easily lead us astray because we put so much faith in them. Our political leaders, they can easily lead us astray because we put quite a bit of faith in them. But Jesus is telling us to watch out. Adults here are vulnerable to a supervisor, a co-worker, a friend, or a spouse. Young folks are vulnerable to friends, teachers, athletes, coaches, musicians, and other celebrities. The list of those people that can lead you astray is almost limitless, and we have to build a spiritual discernment. We have to test the spirits, as John says. And we must follow Christ with great determination. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus in these days and our heart in his words. That is the best way to be careful. Next, Jesus says in verse 7 and 8, he says, When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. At first reading, verse 7 and 8 seem to answer the disciples' questions of what will be the sign of all these things that are about to be accomplished back in verse 4. But Jesus doesn't answer it. He does the opposite. He cites the events that the world often will take as signs of the end times, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines. But he says the end is not yet. The emphasis is not that the signs signal the end, but they do not signal the end. We must be patient. We must remain hopeful. So real quick, while we're here, let's correct some really bad theology that I've been seeing floating around out there. A lot of people um, look to this uh, coronavirus epidemic as maybe God smiting the world or striking the world. You know, that may be, God may be trying to discipline us or get our attention. And that's fine if you want to think that, but just because something bad is happening doesn't mean the end of the world is coming. Okay, we know Jesus is returning. We know he will come back for us. And we say amen to that. We are ready for Jesus to return. But we have to be careful that we don't get so caught up in all the bad things that we begin to start planning like this imminent apocalypse that may not be. So don't take these signs and things as 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 things that are going on as things that are pointing to an imminent return of Christ. We don't know when Christ will come, and we'll talk about that in a second. But don't use this opportunity to promote bad theology about how God released this illness on the world to smite us for something or whatever. God will do what God will do, and he may have very well done certain things like that. But let's not get so caught up in the end of the world stuff that we lose sight of the thing that we are given most through Jesus, and that is hope and love. Okay? Sorry for getting on my soapbox there. I mean, I don't get to get on a literal soapbox because we're virtually preaching, but I'm doing my best here. But be careful how you use theology and how you view things. Um, Jesus says that these things aren't the end. 
that they are the birth pangs, okay? Um, so think about a woman who's about to give birth, a woman who's pregnant. Her, her body is very uncomfortable. They approach birth both fearfully and joyfully. They fear the pain, but they look forward to the baby. And as the time approaches, the, the mood is more joy than fear, more hope than despair. Even at labor's climax, when the pain is the worst, the pain does not wipe out the joy or the hope. You know, I, I saw this in my own life. I've never had a baby. That'd be crazy. If I did, I would make a bajillion dollars. But I haven't had one, so I don't know the full experience of that. But I do understand watching how much joy there is in face of all the pain and adversity. I understand how that really is a reality for ladies who are giving birth. After birth, the painful memories dissolve into, into away and the new mother is left with something greater. She's left with joy. As Mark writes this gospel, the church is amid birth pangs, persecution, false messiahs, Christians being led astray. And during this, Mark reports, these things are the beginning of birth pangs. It is terrible. It is painful. But there is joy ahead, brothers and sisters. We need to remember this during our own time of trouble, that there is hope and joy ahead. So be careful, be wise, keep your eyes open and remember joy is on the horizon that we will get through this. There are indeed wars and rumors of wars. Reading the newspaper can lead to depression. Jesus, however, says that these things are the beginning of birth pangs. He says, this is not the end. This is just the birth pangs. And we struggle with personal crises, a grim medical diagnosis, or the death of a loved one. And Jesus says these things are the beginning of birth, th birth pangs. However terrible, the events of the day are not the final chapter. There is a time of joy ahead. Can I get an amen online? I wish I could hear somebody say amen to me. But the disciples question and request for a sign in verse four. They want to know, Jesus, when is this going to happen? When's the temple going to be overthrown? When is this going to go down? They want to know all the, they want to request a sign that has to do with the destruction of the temple that Jesus has just prophesied. But at the end towards which this chapter points is not the destruction of the temple, but the coming of the son of man. Thank you, Monica and Valerie. Amen to you too. Uh, the destruction of the temple is but one of the pains through which the world will pass on the way to the second coming of Jesus. But what about, here's where this gets real. What about life in the shadow of a pandemic? Well, I had two, two preliminary thoughts. One is that even the systems and powers we recognize may crumble, but God's plans are never thwarted. The systems and powers that we recognize may crumble, but God's plans are never thwarted. We see the government racing to do all these great things and pass these stimulus bills, and we're grateful for living in a place where we can do that. We see other nations crumbling. We see other nations straining like Italy under the weight of this pandemic, and we see all of these things going down, and we think, oh man, things are super bad, but I want you to understand that no matter how bad things get or how bad things look, nothing can stop the plan of God. God. You have to believe that, that no matter what's going on, how high those numbers get of infected people, how many people there are on these statistics lists, how bad the world gets. The poor, the poor people in Jonesboro, Arkansas just had a tornado on top of everything. No matter how bad things get, God's plans cannot be stopped. Understand that. God's plans cannot be stopped by anything or anyone. God's plans are always in the way they're supposed to be. And no, the, the second thing I want you to get about living in this pandemic is that no matter what we endure, there is hope ahead. We should always be watchful for a time for the renewal of all things to come. We need to look forward to that time when Jesus will return, when Jesus will give us a new resurrected body and restore this creation. We need to look forward to that time because we are watchful, because we are even in the middle of all this craziness. We get to be children of the King. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And there is nothing that can take that away. We should be watchful, be looking for our Savior, be looking for that time where he's going to come back and restore all things. 
Jesus concludes his talk with a parable that uh, I've included in the sermon. He says, starting in chapter 13, if you skip towards the end of the chapter of Mark 13, 32, he says, but about the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells each one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So let me ask you, considering all that's going on, are you awake or are you asleep? Paul gives us some encouragement as to why this matters in Ephesians 5. He says this starting in verse 8. He says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything that is exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, listen to this, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, for these days are evil." Be on guard. Wake up. Let Christ shine on you. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of all of your time because these days are evil, but they're not the end. They're just the beginning of birth pangs. There's a whole lot going on that's trying to steal your focus and your attention right now. And we're living in uncharted territory for anyone in our generation, but it is time for us to wake up, church. There's a whole lot of people trying to scare you. There's a whole lot of people trying to reassure you. There's a whole lot of people who are just as anxious as you are. All these things are okay. But just make sure, what we must make sure we're doing is keeping watch. Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We can't know when Jesus is coming back. But what we're going through now collectively as a whole and individually on our own parts It's preparing our hearts for something greater. It's preparing us for the return of the king. And the thing about this, guys, is I know that this is a crazy, crazy time. I never thought that we'd be having to meet like this or that things would spiral out of control as they seemingly have. But you know what? God is in control. I have my moments. I have my moments where I give in to fear And I give in to being scared and I think worst case scenarios just like anybody else. But then I experience once I start turning those thoughts over to God, I start feeling that peace that passes understanding. You know, it is well with my soul. God has given me a peace that passes all understanding. And he's given that same peace to you. And there's a whole lot of people that are trying to scare you right now. There's a whole lot of people who are trying to offer you false hopes. There's a whole lot of people that are trying to reassure you. And there's a whole lot of anxious people out there. But just know that what is going on in the world right now is preparing our hearts for the return of the king. There are always going to be wars There's always going to be rumors of wars. There's always going to be earthquakes and famines and plagues. But don't get so caught up in all the noise that you miss the words of life from Jesus himself. In John 16, 33, he says this. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You will. But he says, but take heart. For I have overcome the world. Jesus promises there is going to be trouble in this world. But we need to take heart. We need to watch. We need to step back and see the hope that's unfolding and blooming. And we need to realize that he has overcome the world. 
There's nothing that can stop God's plans. There's nothing that's going to stop Jesus from saving the world. There's nothing that can happen in this creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes in Romans 8. Amen to that. John also writes this in 1 John 4, 4. He says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So let's take this down to not just you'll have trouble in the world, but Jesus has overcome the world. Now it says that the one who is in you, the Holy Spirit, who you've been baptized into, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world or Satan. Okay, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. There is nothing that can stop you from living your faith. There is nothing that can stop you from taking confidence that this world is not our home and we're just passing through as we sing. There's nothing to stop us from taking joy and peace in Christ in these times. Jesus has overcome the world. He has overcome it all. And the one in you through the Holy Spirit dwells in you is greater than anything in this world. So no matter where you find yourself, keep watch, be ready, look for opportunities to do good, love God, love your neighbor, and listen to the word himself, Jesus Christ, as he prepares our hearts for the new things he's doing after we get through this difficult time. There is hope. It is what sustains us. It holds us. And it is paving the way for what God is doing next in the world through you, through us, the church. So stay alert. Pay attention. A new day is coming. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, your name is holy. There is none like you. There is no one like you. Son of man, you encourage your followers to obey only your voice. And promise that you that we would see your glorious presence. Show us your glory and teach us to obey. Teach us to keep watch this day. Father, I pray for all of us that we would have comfort from you. That you would protect us from illness. That you would let us serve the world around us, even in the smallest of ways. Your word says that giving just a cup of cold water in your name counts as serving you in big ways. And so, Father, I pray for every person. I pray for all of us that we will hear your voice today, that we will take comfort knowing that you have overcome the world and know that greater are you who are, is in us than he who is in the world, that we stand firm as your people waiting for this collective work you're doing through this difficult time to unfurl into something beautiful, that you're going to bring beauty from the ashes, that you're going to rise us up stronger than ever through these dark times. And we trust in you to do that. And we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So guys, uh, as, as we close out, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to offer the invitation, but I just want you to know that Jesus loves you and he died for you and he's given his life to save you from your sins. And so if you have prayer needs, you can post them on this chat. You can send them to me or the elders. You can give us a call. Anything we can pray with you about, we will. Um, if you're well and this message has moved you and you feel like you need to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then we just ask that you would um, do that you would approach us, send us a message, whatever the case may be, if you need to be baptized into Christ and you're well and not sick. Uh, we don't want to spread anything any further, but we will take care of you as best we can. Um, I um, love each and every one of you. I'm thankful for you. I miss you guys so much. I'm going stir crazy. Pray for my wife and kids as they have to deal with me going nuts. Um, but um, I'm thankful for each of you and I'm thankful for our time together as we get to meet each week and I can't wait to see you all again. So if there's anything that you need, please just let me or the elders know. Um, again, I'll be on vacation next week. So Rob is teaching the live stream here um, on Wednesday night at 7 and Nolan will be preaching the sermon next Sunday right here um, at 10 a.m. So if you need anything, get a hold of us. We love you guys. We can't wait to see you again. Um, and don't forget um, to um, remember everyone in your prayers and um, 
to love your neighbor as yourself as you love God. We love you. Um, and um, oh, I see that, Darren. I miss Rob's announcements, too. I wish I could figure out a way to get Rob in here to do the top five, but we're social distancing, so we can't do all that stuff. Uh, but we love you. We thank you for all that you do. Please just keep supporting the church and, and um, just praying for us, and we'll make it through this time on the other side stronger than we've ever been. We love you guys. God bless.